Is it scary when you hear Revelation? Because that's that book with all those scary things, all those, ooh, big technicolor beasts with four heads and four horsemen, and one's pale, and one's this color, and one's that. It's crazy stuff, isn't it? People will say to me when I go to a church, and I've told you this before, let's do a study on the book of Revelation. My first question is, why? The answer is usually something, because I want to know about the end times. And I'll say to them, what end times? My end times. I want to know if it's the North Koreans or the Chinese or the Russians. I want to know what's going to happen. And I always say to them, you're not going to find that out there because even Jesus said, only the Father in heaven knows the day and the hour. I don't know. It's above my pay grade. Sort of a modern paraphrase of what he said, but you get that, right? But people want to know. And I'll say, I'll sum it up for you in two words. God wins. God wins. The best is yet to come. So we're going to look at some stuff this morning, and one is a hymn. It's not in our hymnal. I'm so happy to say this is not in our hymnal. If you know it, sing it with me, and then forget about it. Tempted and tried, we're oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us never molested though in the wrong farther along we'll know all about it farther along we'll understand why cheer up my brother live in the sunshine we'll understand it all by and by next verse is even worse when death has come and taken our loved ones it leaves our home so lonely and drear Then do we wonder why others prosper, living so wicked year after year. We'll understand the sweet by and by why Jesus lets them get away with it, and we're here suffering. That is bad theology, boys and girls. Take that hymn, rip it out of your hymnal, rip it out of your heart, because it is not a good one. Because what it's really saying is one day you're going to get yours. Now, theologian N.T. Wright, I got to meet him once, which was lovely. He has a British, um, he's he's a bishop in the Church of England, He's a theologian, he's a prolific writer, he's a seminary professor, and he's funny as all get out. I think I've told you this before, too, that he was entering the country. This is before COVID hit. I saw him 10 years ago, so this is about 10 or 12 years ago. He entered the country, he got to the U.S. Customs, and they said, so you're a bishop, huh? He said, yes, I am. And he said, well, if you're a bishop, you should be able to recite John 3.16, I bet you can't do that, can you? And he said, oh, I can. He said, let me hear it. This is someone, when someone's entering our country whose name is bishop or reverend or reverend bishop or whatever, the right reverend bishop, because he's British and that's got all sorts of titles there, you'd think they'd welcome him, especially someone who's a Christian. But he said, prove it to me, recite it for me. And he said, I couldn't help myself. He said, I recited it to him in Greek. This is a very bright man and very funny. But he wrote a book on the resurrection, this is a great book, and the resurrection and its implication for the church today in the world. And one of the things he said that too many Christians think that heaven is a beautiful place, which I agree with, because what it would say in the book of Revelation, we're not going to go float up and live on a cloud somewhere with little wings, like in the white cloud toilet paper commercials, but heaven's going to come to earth, that Jesus Christ is going to bring the kingdom. What did it say? We won't need a light because God himself is the light. When heaven comes to earth, it's a beautiful garden, and we all have everything we need. We're all happy. But in the middle of that garden, he says, too many many Christians, and I agree with that, too many Christians believe, in the middle of the garden, there's a coliseum where you get to go and watch the people who done you wrong roast over an open fire for all eternity. That's the entertainment for some folks in heaven. Farther along, we'll understand all about it. We'll know it then. I disagree with that kind of theology. I've told you before that my theology begins in the future. My theology begins with the second coming of Christ because when Christ comes again, I believe he's coming again and he's going to bring heaven to earth and everything is going to be made right. What is upside down is going to be turned right side up. God will reign forever and ever. It's what we read in the book of Revelation. Like I said, God wins. So what does that mean for us now? Do we sit back and say, farther along, we'll understand why we had to put up with you people the rest of our lives so we can watch you burn. That's a good thing. Or we can say, no, that if Christ is going to reign, he's got to reign in my heart right now. He's got to reign in my life right now. 
He's got to change the way things happen in my life right now. Anybody here knew the Disciple Bible Study in the past, those 34 weeks classes? I taught, I was one of the first disciple teachers. I had to go away and be trained how to teach disciple. And I remember my class sitting there, and it was a class of people with pretty high education levels. There were people with PhDs, everything else. When we got to this part of Revelation, they were having a hard time with the concepts there. I said, I have a book in my office that's going to clear this right up. Written by one of my favorite theologians. His name is Jürgen Moltmann. Anybody other than Mark Smiley ever heard of Jürgen Moltmann? He was the author of a book called The Theology of Hope, and he is where I really learned what is called realized eschatology, meaning it's the end times that inform this time that we live in now. This is what he wrote. Listen, because I read this and the people went, what are you talking about that cleared it up? That is why faith, wherever it develops into hope, causes not rest but unrest, not patience but impatience. Faith does not calm the quiet, unquiet heart. I'm sorry, let me do that again. Faith and hope do not calm the unquiet heart, but it is itself this unquiet heart in man. Those who hope in Christ can no longer put up with reality as it is, but begin to suffer under it to contradict it. Peace with God means conflict with the world, where the goat of the promised future steps inexorably into the flesh of every unfulfilled present. Everybody's looking at me going, what? That cleared it up? How many of you feel that way now that I read that? Let me read the line again that really gets to the heart of it. Those who hope in Christ can no longer put up with reality as it is, but begin to suffer under it and to contradict it. If Christ is your future, then your present has to align with Christ, which means some things have to change. Last week was one of the few weeks that I did not watch the news before I came to church. I always watch the news Sunday morning because I feel like I have to do that. I need to know what's going on in the world. And I didn't watch it on Sunday morning. I didn't watch it on Saturday afternoon because Saturday... Here at 1 p.m. I preached my cousin's funeral and I went home and just sort of turned off the world and spent some time alone in prayer. I didn't know what had happened in Buffalo. Did not know what happened in Buffalo. And nobody here brought it up. I'm hoping y'all didn't know either what happened. Because 10 people were murdered. Why? Why were they murdered in Buffalo? Because of the color of their skin. By an 18-year-old kid, a teenager, who had been taught to hate. That kind of hate is taught. You don't naturally, you're not born hating people for any reason. You're not born looking at people as different. If you read my blog this week, which I'm sure a lot of you did not do, which is fine with me, but I talked about toddlers will play together. They don't care what anybody looks like. They don't care if they have one arm, one leg, if they're in a wheelchair. They don't care. They just don't care, but by the time they're 11, 12, 13 years old, they're either bullies or bullied in a lot of cases because of what they have heard adults say. And so this child, at 18 years old, went into a grocery store with a gun and killed people because they were different. He had been taught to hate them. That is something that contradicts the kingdom of God. That is something that contradicts the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is something that means that we have to change the reality because we suffer under it. There are a lot of things like that, aren't there? What are the things that we have to suffer under as Christians in the world? What are the things that stick in our side and needle us until we have to do something about it? Racism is one for me. What else is there? What? Abuse. Amen to abuse being something that you got to stand up against. What else? What? Bullying. Bullying. Amen. What else do we have to stand up against? Part of me wanted to try to start a movement around the world that the people of God and Jesus Christ would stand and face Russia and put our hands up and say, Vladimir Putin, in the name of Christ our Lord, stop what you're doing. Because I think there's power in things like that. But we just feel powerless, don't we? We feel powerless. That's why we have to go back to this lesson again and again and again from John. Jesus is going to die the next day, but he says to his disciples, don't be sad about it, like the woman with the fork in her hand. Don't be sad about it, because when I go, the Spirit's going to come. The Spirit will remind you everything I taught you while I was here. 
The Spirit will remind you. The Spirit will open your minds to understanding my word. The Spirit will guide you and empower you, which is why the Spirit comes and rests on people as flame, a symbol of power and strength and might. So if you're feeling weak and inconsequential in the world, you got Jesus Christ. you got the Spirit, but you got to go there and you got to read his word. You've got to study his word. You've got to let it move you into the world so that you change what can be changed. Homelessness, poverty, oppression of any kind are antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They cannot coexist with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have been equipped and called and sent into the world to do that. Somebody said to me one day, you're going to get yourself shot, you know that. Maybe I will, I don't know. I haven't been shot so far, and I've shot off my mouth plenty in the world. I was in a WIC office with my stepdaughter-in-law once, and a woman hit her little baby on his face so hard that another kid screamed. I got up without thinking, put my finger in her face, said, do it again, lady, and you're going to go to jail, because I will make sure. If you ever hit him again, I will know. God will let me know, and I will come for you. You know what she did? She cried. I said, don't you cry. I said, stop hitting your child. Do you understand me? She's like, yes, I understand you. I don't know if she did or not. But at that moment, I didn't care what she did to me because I'm not going to sit by and watch somebody slap a child, a little two-year-old child, so hard she left a handprint on his face. That's why years ago I went out and I got myself arrested in a protest at the South African Embassy. I've told you that story before. My mother was not happy with me. She's still probably not happy that I did that. I was going to go stand across the street and pray because the guy I was dating at the time was going to be arrested, protesting apartheid. Nelson Mandela was in prison at the time. He'd been there for 26 years at that time. And God called me a wimp. I didn't know God spoke out of Aramaic and Greek and Hebrew and said wimp, but I had heard the voice of God say, what a wimp, what a wuss you are, Terry. You're going to go pray for somebody taking a stand? I thought you would take a stand, and I finally said, yes, Lord, I will go. I was arrested. I spent one day in jail. Not a big deal. Nelson Mandela had been there for 26 years. He no longer could stand up. He walked bent over because he was not in a cell that was big enough for him to stand up in. I did not get him out of prison. I've said this before. I'm not the one who got him released, but me and a couple million of my friends sure as heck did. We have got to learn to take a stand in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what was it that we read in Revelation about that tree? What we say about the tree of life? The tree of life is back in the book of Revelation. Where did you see it the first time? Anybody would remember where it shows up the first time in Scripture, the tree of life? Genesis. Because they're given a choice, aren't they? There's, there are all these beautiful trees that can eat from any kind they want, and there's the tree of life, and they choose what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because people just have this itch inside to know more and to be like God, to have more power than we have. We have all the power in the world in Jesus Christ, but we want the earthly power. We want the power that we think is the, what's going to change the world and our benefit. But what happens in the the new garden. The tree of life is there again. No longer are we cut off from it. We can just freely eat from it. And from it flows the water from the throne of God. And there are leaves on the tree. And there's fruit on the tree. And the leaves are for what? The healing of the nations. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples? I'm going to leave. And my peace I'm going to give you. Not like the world gives. I'm going to give you my peace. Which says to me, we're called to be people of peace. Peace. Not people who are wimps, not people who are quiet, not people who just sort of roll over and take whatever's coming. There's a difference between being a foot washer and a doormat. We're called to wash feet, not to let people walk all over us. But the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you my peace. I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm going to pour my spirit into you. Don't Be sorry that I'm leaving, because when I leave, you're going to be able to do what I can do and more. We're going to read that one the next week or the week after, I believe. So don't go out of here feeling weak and ineffectual in the world. Go out there and kick some behind in the name of your Savior. Because God will call you to do things that you don't think you possibly possibly could do. Take a stand, people. Stand up against racism. It's something we can all speak out against. 
breaks my heart to think that there are school systems that aren't going to teach slavery anymore because it makes white people feel bad. Tough. Makes us feel bad, doesn't it? I found out that my great-great-grandfather was a slave owner. I was horrified. I was surprised because I didn't think anybody in my family had enough money to own anything, much less people. They don't own people. They thought they did. And he went to church every Sunday, listened to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and still thought that was all right. It is not all right, not all right, not all right. One of the heroes in my own life is a man named Bill Stuller, who was the treasurer in my last congregation. He was kind of a curmudgeonly guy, but, you know, I got to know him and love him dearly. He grew up in rural Virginia. He was drafted during the Vietnam War, and he went to basic training. And then he charged down to his commanding officer's office and said, I cannot sleep in that room. And he said, what do you mean you can't sleep in that room? He said, my roommate, I can't sleep in that room. And he said, what's wrong with your roommate? He said, he's black. And the commanding officer swore at him and said, get that something out of my office and get in your room, boy. He was horrified. He thought, they can't draft me and then tell me I have to sleep with a black person. He said if he had never been forced to do that, he would have missed out on the best friend he ever had in his life. He said, I would have died for him, he would have died for me, and we almost died for each other many times during the war. He changed his life then and there. And Bill wasn't just somebody who was quiet about it after that. He shared that story, and he also shared with me, he had helped his neighbor out many times, his neighbor who was an elderly white man. And he shoveled his snow and did all these things for him. And Bill was not a spring chicken. Bill's in his 70s and was helping out a man in his 80s. The man said to him one day, you know, the worst thing this country ever did was to outlaw slavery. And Bill said, shame on you. Shame on you. He said, no, they ought to all be enslaved. You're no good for anything else. Bill said, I'm done. I'm never going to help you again. Find somebody else to do your work for you. His wife said, that's sort of hard. And he said, I, I can't do this. I cannot listen to that kind of talk. You know what happened? His neighbor thought about it and came over and said, I really didn't mean what I said. Bill said, well, then you got to stop talking that way, sir. And the man started to change. Only because somebody opened their mouth and said something. We're too quiet, folks. we got to speak out against injustice and oppression. Things like bullying and things like racism. Just I have never understood, I will never understand how anybody could look at another human being because their skin is a different color, because they came from a different place, because they speak a different language and have any hatred for them. I don't understand it, and I never have. Sometimes people will say things to me like, well, you didn't grow up in the world I grew up in. I'm telling you, there are many people. There's one generation ahead of mine. I am, I am in the off-ramp to being the oldest generation in the country. Don't tell me that you saw stuff that I didn't see. And if you start a sentence with, but they... I will say to you, have you met them all? I have people say to me, well, you don't know what they're like. I said, have you met them all, all of them? Anytime it's them and us, we've got a problem. So I'm going to tell you, if you hear things like that, speak out in the name of your Savior. Let the Spirit guide you to remind you what Jesus taught you, because Jesus didn't teach us to act like that with each other, did he? Did he? Jesus taught us to love especially when it costs us something. Like I said in last week's sermon, you know, don't wait till it's easy to love somebody to love because you never will know what love is unless you work at it. I'm going to be cremated. Maybe they'll stick a fork in with my... my cremains. But the best is yet to come. Don't wait for Christ to come to be his disciple. Don't wait for heaven to know that you are resurrected now. Because resurrection doesn't just apply to the future. When you know Jesus Christ, it changes your life. You want to be baptized. You want to live like his disciple. You want to stand for what he stands for. You want to speak out when he tells you to speak out. And you've got to love no matter what else you've got to love. How many of you want to be buried with a fork in your hand? How many of you believe the best is yet to come? Live like it now. Amen. Let's sing about